Fitzgerald. And I want to thank the organizers of QCRIP for giving me this opportunity to tell you about our recent work. Uh, if you look at the printed program, this is not the title that's in the printed program, because in fact, between the abstract submission time and the present, we've made some very considerable theoretical progress. And as well, I'm going to show you some preliminary experimental results. This is a joint work in which uh, graduate student Chun Tao Zhuang is the lead theorist with others supporting him in a variety of ways. And uh, Zhexian Zhang is responsible principally uh, with support from the rest of us on the experimental results that you'll, you'll hear about. And uh, both, both uh, Chun Tao and, and senior scientist Franco Wang are, are here in the audience today. So let me tell you about what I'll be telling you about. In 2009, I proposed a protocol that could defeat active eavesdropping by using entanglement, despite the fact that the channel over which it was employed, the bosonic channel, was in fact entanglement breaking. It derived its high secure rate from the use of multiple modes per bit, and that implied many photons per bit, and that allows you to deal with loss much better than existing uh, quantum communication protocols. But it had a weakness. It had to store the idler beam from the original entanglement, and there's loss in that, and that uh, degrades its ability to communicate over long distances. But it is a two-way protocol in which Alice sends light unmodulated to Bob. Bob imposes information on it, sends it back to Alice. And therefore, it becomes very vulnerable to an active eavesdropping attack. Passive eavesdropping is when Eve just listens to light leaking out of the forward and backward channels, the Alice to Bob and Bob to Alice links. In an active channel, Eve says, well, active eavesdropping attack, Eve says, look, I'll send my own light into Bob, let him modulate that light, and then I'll get his information. So what we have now found is to replace our entanglement source with amplified spontaneous emission light, we'll still derive a security from a low brightness signal transmission, much like BB84 or even continuous variable QKD, plus the no cloning theorem, no more entanglement being employed. But now we'll get a much higher secure rate than existing protocols because we're going to use an enormous number of modes per bit, and that translates into many photons per bit, whereas BB84 typically operates with a small number of modes per bit, small number of photons per bit, small fraction, as does CVQKD. But because of the way we've done this, we retain a high brightness reference light that eliminates this idler storage loss problem, and moreover, by augmenting the amplified spontaneous emission source with uh, entanglement-based channel monitoring, we have a way to defeat active eavesdropping. So I've given you an overall outline and as well a summary, so it's time to get down to business here. What I have up here is a, a notional diagram of the original protocol that I published in 2009. Alice has a spontaneous parametric down converter source, continuous wave, sends out the signal, think of this notionally as a fiber link, retains the idler with another fiber, fiber providing a, a delay line. Bob does binary phase shift key modulation and then uses an optical amplifier with two purposes. The amplifier's gain is going to overcome the losses on the return path, but perhaps more importantly, the amplifier's noise is going to mask the message that Bob has imposed from Eve. Now, these are meant or at least Alice and Bob think they're fiber connections, Eve replaces the typical low-loss fiber with lossless fiber and a beam splitter so that Alice to Bob and Bob to Alice has the same transmissivity as no Eve. She gets all the light leaking out this way, all the light leaking out that way, and she's going to build her receiver. And to give you a flavor of why this protocol can work, here is the uh, error probability for Alice best known receiver where she uses a low gain optical parametric amplifier driven by the, the retained idler after its delay line and the returned light and followed by direct detection. So it depends on the phase matching bandwidth and on the bit rate that Bob's using, his amplified spontaneous emission noise and his amplifier gain. This is the brightness, photons per second per hertz of Alice's down converter source. Cap S is the transmissivity. The reason this goes is cubed, it's a one-way transmissivity. So outbound, you suffer this loss. The amplifier overcomes that loss. But this must be equivalent to the round trip delay. And so there's a factor of cap S squared there. And that's bad. If Eve builds an optimum quantum receiver, her error, error probability has a similar sort of form. 
except she only gets the forward loss. But the fact that I started with entangled light at low brightness means there's a difference between ns here, much smaller than 1, and ns squared there. And so, at least for some ranges, Alice can have a much lower error probability than Eve, and she can get, therefore, immunity to a, uh, an individual attack in this passive uh, eavesdropping scheme. Now, in 2013, led by Zhe Zhang, we completed a proof of principle experiment of this protocol. Uh, it's much more complicated looking than my sing simple block diagram from the preceding slide, but I, I won't show it to you. What is important here are the experimental results. This is bit error rate, call it log base 10 of probability of error, versus the log base 10 of that brightness. And this is a theory curve computed not from the formula I showed on the preceding page, but from a formula that includes all the possible non-idealities in our experiment, where those non-idealities were experimentally measured, inefficiencies and extraneous losses of all time types. And the data points fall right on that curve. Now, we can't build, because we don't know how to build, Eve's optimum quantum receiver. So we built the best receiver we knew how to build for Eve. And again, that had non-idealities in it. And we calibrated those parameters experimentally. And the data points match perfectly. And even if we built the best receiver we knew how to build with no non-idealities, there would still be an enormous gap in error probability. And so there are other curves on here. The basic message is that we have, A, verified that there's an enormous disparity in error probabilities. And because the theory matches experiments so well, we can then calculate an information advantage on a per bit basis as a function of, of the source brightness. So here, this is the mutual information between Alice and Bob, the Shannon information. This is upper bound on Eve's Halevo information about what Bob had sent. And the difference is their information advantage, which can be a substantial fraction here, about eight-tenths of a bit information advantage per bit that Bob modulated there. This can be used against passive eavesdropping for direct communication, because all the bits are being received. And you could also do QKD. But idler storage loss is a problem because of that kappa s cubed. This will not go as far as we would like it to go. And of course, the big problem is the uh, susceptibility to active eavesdropping. So here's a way to beat idler storage loss. We decided it wasn't necessary to use a down converter. We'll use a source of bright amplified spontaneous emission, like a erbium doped fiber amplifier. And then we'll use beam split arrangements to have a low brightness fraction of that sent out as the signal to Bob. And Bob does the usual things that he did from the previous version of the protocol. But this reference is now bright many, many photons per second per hertz, amplified spontaneous emission, perfectly correlated with this one at the classical level. That can sustain a fiber delay line. You can put it through an optical amplifier and long fiber delay lines and maintain a near perfect reference now for a receiver that's going to do broadband homodyne detection on the light coming back from Bob. So again, E puts in her lossless fiber and her beam splitters, and now the error probabilities look like this. Eve's is the same as before. It's for this optimum quantum receiver, which we don't know how to build. This is what Alice's is. She's lost the factor of two that we would have gained from the entanglement source. But most importantly, she only has a cap S loss here, not a cap S cubed. And so this system will go much farther. And more importantly, CW down converters, at least with the high quality bulk crystal devices that we've and others use, you can get up to about 10 to the minus 3 in brightness for the source. With this amplified spontaneous emission source, we can go considerably brighter. And that, you'll see, enables us to go even farther. So here, we've plotted a comparison between the parametric amplifier down converter system and the homodyne detection amplified spontaneous emission system. This is the log base 10 of secure rate, bits per second. Uh, and this is against the collective attack, passive eavesdropping, versus one-way path length of the usual fiber loss a typical 2 terahertz phase matching bandwidth for the down converter, and we match that with the amplified spontaneous emission. We're up in the gigabit per second range when we're running Bob's modulator, wherever I put it, at uh, 10 gigahertz. Here it is. And these are the brightnesses that give this optimal performance. We've optimized the brightness. Uh, we see the ASE is up at around 10 to the minus 1, where the SPDC can't 
can't reach this anyway, it would probably be constrained there, but we allow it to go higher. The other important thing is, at least for the ASC source, homodyne arrangement, we've constrained Alice's error probability, which is why there's a breakpoint here, to be no more than a tenth, because for error probabilities that low, we can find high efficiency error correcting codes that could be run on fast electronics in real time. So here, we're predicting uh, great stuff. This system should be capable of 3.5 gigabit per second quantum secured direct communication or QKD at 50 kilometer range. This is many orders of magnitude beyond state of the art. So even if we put some non-idealities in, there's a lot of room to still beat the best. But of course, we've got to look at this active eavesdropping. So here's the setup that beat passive eavesdropping. But now Eve says, look, why don't I inject my own light in? Then Bob will modulate it, and I'm going to use uh, a down converter to do that, my own down converter, and I'll make some comments about that optimality later. But Alice is saying, oh, we better watch out for that, so I'm going to superimpose on top of my ASE source some down converter light and have a single photon detector to monitor the idler there. And Bob will do the same thing. He'll put a single photon detector, tap out a little light coming to him, and do some monitoring there. And we'll have Alice add another tap in after she combined her down converter light and her uh, ASC light and put a detector there. And as a result of this, measuring singles and coincidences, they're going to be able, Alice and Bob that is, to estimate the fraction of light coming in to Bob's terminal that came from Eve. And therefore, keeping that sufficiently low, they can uh, assure security. So here is how they bound Eve's injection of SBDC light. They measure the singles on Alice's idler, the singles on what she's tapped out of the signal heading to Bob, Bob's uh, signal tap, and coincidences between the idler and the signal tap in Alice's uh, equipment, and the uh, idler at Alice's end and Bob's signal tap. And then you can show, if we had perfect results for these, that the fraction of light, Eve's optical power into Bob divided by the total optical power into Bob, this number, which is what we want to know, would exactly satisfy this relationship where these delta CIAs are the uh, coincidences minus the accidentals. And we've done this experiment. We have these channel monitors set up, and we've purposefully injected a certain fraction of light from Eve, and we do an estimation of what that fraction is exactly along these lines using the time average values for these various quantities, singles and coincidences. And we get excellent agreement, and we can monitor down below the 1% level, below the 1% level for injection. That's significant to us, to get down to that level. Of course, Eve, as she can in, I think, all QKD systems, can perform a denial of service attack by injecting more than that, by cutting the fiber, by doing all sorts of things. But if she's trying to gain the secret information or she's trying to deduce the key, then she has to keep herself below the level that we accept. So here's the system now. This is another calculation where we optimize the uh, brightness leaving uh, Alice en route to Bob for a secure rate. We have a nominal, easily achieved bandwidth. We're running standard single mode fiber type things. These gains and, and ASC noises don't matter too much because they're they, you could use a variety of values and, and get there, but these are the values that, that we use in this optimization. We're constraining Bob's modulator to 10 gigabits per second, and Alice this, same numbers as before. And now you see, if we keep Eve to this 1% fraction of the light coming into Bob, we're above a gigabit per second at 50 kilometers. We're still running reasonable brightness. It turns out this is Eve's optimal, optimal beam splitter attack as long as her injection is low brightness, which would certainly be the case here. This is QKD only, no longer direct communication, because Alice and Bob can't be secured in transmitting information until they've done enough monitoring to uh, presume that Eve is held to this 1%. So they're going to do QKD here, and they can do it at 2 gigabits per second at 50 kilometers. Here are preliminary experimental results. This is the theory, and this points our experiments. For a passive individual attack, this is error probability versus photons per bit. We usually plot versus brightness, but because of the bit rate at which we ran, 100 megabits per second, and, and the, the uh, ASC bandwidth, uh, 200 
photons per bit is a brightness of 10 to the minus 2. And we get quite good agreement in this preliminary experiment between theory and experiment for Alice. We haven't built a uh, passive eaves eavesdropper yet. But because of this match to theory, we can calculate Alice and Bob Shannon information. We can calculate an upper bound on Eve's active and Eve's passive attacks. And we can look at the differences, the predicted information advantage for Alice and Bob, which is, of course, higher for just a passive attack than it is for an active attack. But at the 100 megabit per second we're transmitting, you can still get above 60 or close to, to 80, depending on which attack is in play. So here's the summary. You can read down through this. I think I'll just give you, because I'm probably over time, that uh, the last point here about the active attack, and it had to be QKD, well, not really. If you could imagine, and I'll give you if you ask me the question, a fantastic quantum memory so that Bob can hold on to the light that he was going to modulate and send back to Alice long enough for them to channel monitor and say, hey, Eve is not intruding too much. Then, in fact, he could do direct communication. That's going to be an incredible challenge. So let me just give you things that uh, we know about. 50 kilometers, we think, against passive eavesdropping, we could do 3.5 gigabits per second. 2 gigabits per second, same distance. If it's an active eavesdropper. But the most important and final thing I'm going to say is, to do this, we didn't need any new technology. The source exists. The two sources we need, the detectors we need exist, modulators we need. So this protocol is ready to go in some ways. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, questions? Um, I see one at the back there. There's a microphone coming. Yes, your, your active attack looks a bit like uh, uh, what we call the um, untangling cloner for continuous variable cryptography, where instead of injecting just noise, if should keep a half of an untangled pair. Have you looked at that? Eve is actually keeping half of an entangled source. Okay. It's, it's the same, it's same in that regard. Uh, but this is uh, a system which depends upon, for Eve, the quadrature entanglement between the signal and idler that give her the same kind of advantage in the original Alice using a down converter. And we've shown, Chun Tao has shown, that uh, if uh, the brightness is low, that saturates the entanglement assisted capacity and there's no better state for her to use in that case. And the fact that we're using channel monitoring down to 1% and the fact that what Alice is sending down the pipe to Bob is already at brightness 0.1 puts Eve very squarely in the low brightness regime for which that is the optimum state or in an equivalence class for optimum state. Okay, we have a question here. Yes, so this is really a fascinating talk. Uh, I have a practical question to ask. Uh, so you, you, you are encoding uh, on many modes, and uh, so you have broadband. As if, if you have high rates, do you need uh, one modulator per mode, or do you, how, how many modulators do you need? Does it scale with the bandwidth or something like this? There's one monitoring system. It takes the full broadband light in and, and measures that. So you need high order modulation, not only BPSK, right? Or no, this is BPSK only. It takes the, the, the entire light beam in, the terahertz light beam, and just flips the phase or not, depending on whether it's a zero or one being sent. On all modes? All modes. OK. OK, we had a question just here. Yes. Um, so did I understand correctly that the uh, entangled photon, which is sent from Alice and then back to Bob, this is used to assure the security of the system and the uh, ASE no source mainly or the ASE the source is being used for the communication. The entangled source is used to determine the fraction of light coming yeah. into Bob that comes from Eve and therefore be able to constrain that to a sufficiently low level that there is security. So and then just in preparation of the next talk, this is this entangled part looks very similar to this ping pong protocol. Are you familiar with this? Or is it actually the same idea which the entanglement is not being used to communicate anything. It's just for security. Yeah. So the, the it's different in that, as I understand ping pong, you're communicating and ensuring security at the same time. So we're, we're not doing that with just the entangled light. If we were doing it with the entangled light, 
we would not be able to go this rate and distance because of the, the storage loss problem. That was already true for the passive eavesdropping. Active eavesdropping would be even worse. Okay, I think we had one. Is it, it's a quick question. <laughs> ah, yes. Um, so I, I'm very curious about how, you, how your detection system actually worked out because uh, if you um, uh, you know, interfere coherent to light, so then uh, there is beating, uh, you know, it magnifies the strength of the signal. But with uh, incoherent lights, when you mix them together, uh, interfere, uh, interfere them together, you, do, you might not have the uh, gain due to beating of the reference signal and the uh, signal. Well, the reference signal, this is an interferometric protocol. The reference signal is coherent with the return, except for the phase flips put in by Bob's modulator and the amplified spontaneous emission from Bob's amplifier. So you do get the mixing gain. You, do do, you are doing homodyne detection, but it's different than the usual laser local oscillator homodyne detection, because here we have a two terahertz bandwidth local oscillator, very bright. You do get mixing gain. It does work. We've done the experiment. Uh, OK, so uh, if I can, I, I, I want to discuss with you sure. after this one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we'll just thank uh, Jeff Shapiro once more. Thank <laughs> you.